In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the spiritual life, there are many ups and downs with the purpose of our Lord visiting us and revealing himself to us so that we can believe in him and see him, taste him, love him, and experience him going through our veins, so to speak, going through our reins, going through our mind and our heart. The opposite of what happens when one is separated from God and when one does not have God dwelling in him. And in the spiritual life, oftentimes what happens is our Lord visits us after a great trial. It's sort of some type of a recompense, but not just a recompense. In order for us to receive a certain gift or some type of grace, we will have to do the work commensurate to that grace, which will be able to help us handle that grace. There are a lot of lessons that we must learn in order to receive that grace, because if we receive the grace without having worked for it, it could be bad for us. First and foremost, we fall into pride. We have this proclivity to pride, unfortunately, and we can lose sight of who is the giver, who is the one that gives the gift, where does the gift come from, how did it come to us, and how did we receive it, and how did we achieve it. And so first, we need watchfulness. We need to be paying attention. We need care for the things of God, care for the things of our soul, because without that, we're going to lose at least half of what's happening to us. It's like the example of what we hear in the life of St. John Kukuzelis, those monastics who were chanting with knowledge and who were praying. With knowledge received a gold coin, but those who did it without really understanding what was going on still received something. It was like a little penny. And so for this reason, we must be attentive to those things which the Lord passes to us, which the Lord gives to us. And there's not going to be any attentiveness without some type of quiet, particularly internal quiet. The external quiet is there only to help the internal quiet. And as we've heard many times in the lives of saints and the sayings of the Desert Fathers, it's very easy for someone to bring the world into the desert. And then there are those cases of those who live in the world who have the isichia, which the quiet which is necessary for one to achieve God's grace. So we see this, we see this trend and we see this spiritual law, specifically also in the case of the apostles and the myrrh-bearers. You remember a few weeks ago, I talked a little bit about the social conformity. People tend to conform to the people around them very easily. And uh, unfortunately, that's what happened at the time of our Savior's crucifixion with the disciples. They conformed, the majority of them, with the exception of the great theologian John, because they saw the masses rebuking Christ and at that moment, the Lord was the most humiliated of all men. And who wants to partake of that humility, of that humiliation? So even the disciples of our Savior at that time could not humble themselves enough to be seen as those who belong to Christ, the closest, the closest to Christ, his disciples. But also there were the myrrh-bearers, and the myrrh-bearers were faithful. And at the time of the crucifixion, the myrrh-bearers were there. And <clears throat> as we've said before, the great theologian John, who was at the crucifixion of our Savior, as we know from the accounts of the crucifixion of our Savior, was the only one of the 12 disciples who was not martyred. He didn't shed his blood but he was there when our Savior shed his blood. And that sufficed for him. That was his homologia, that was his confession. He said, I am with this man. 
And the myrrh bearers were the faithful ones, too. Many of them stayed with our Savior. And at this point, when the men were weak, the women were stronger. You see, sometimes women are much weaker than men. Sometimes men are weaker than women. It all depends. There is no inequality for us, especially in the way that the world likes to, uh, to point out. But the man has his place and the woman has her place, even as St. Paul tells us in his epistle, which we read at the marriage service. But the women had something going. They had something very strong in their hearts. And so they mourned with Christ. They mourned for Christ, although we don't really mourn for Christ because Christ gave us joy. We mourn for ourselves. As our Savior says, mourn not for me, but mourn for yourselves and for your children. And they were so enlightened by this scene, beholding the redemption of the world taking place, Christ shedding his blood and refashioning that which had been distorted by the evil devil and by his evil angels. His blood mingled with the earth at that time and one commandment was given to John the theologian, basically to take care of the mother of our Savior Jesus Christ. And she was first and foremost, as we all know, the first God by grace, the first who was able to achieve such sanctification. She was not sinless because she was sinless by nature. Only God is sinless by nature. But she had a choice, like all of us, even the angels have those choice, they had those choices to be faithful or not. And she turned away from all manner of sin. This gate shall be shut. As we hear in the Old Testament concerning the Holy Mother of God. St. Gregor Palamas teaches us that she was the first of the myrrh-bearing women. It's so obvious that it wasn't even needed to be mentioned in the Gospels. But she was the first. She was a mother mourning for her child. And her child was not just any child. Her child was working miracles. Her child had the ability to impart holiness to all of his creatures. And so they went through a difficult trial. As we said in the spiritual life, after a difficult trial, there's a visitation of grace, all depending on the person. As we chant in the dismiss him of the transfiguration, the Lord showed himself and his glory to his disciples as, as they could endure, according as each one could endure. So not everybody can endure this grace. Sometimes it's too much for them. They can't handle it because they could fall into pride. And you've heard now St. Isaac, the words of St. Isaac, a gift given to someone without a previous trial could be disastrous for that person. So people should not be surprised. <laughs> this is something which I deal with in confession. People should not be surprised when they pray for humility and then all of a sudden the Lord sends them a way that they could learn humility. The Lord wants you to learn. Humility is not just going to be given to you. It's something which is achieved. It's something which is learned. It's something which is experienced. And as Abad Dorothea says, when you ask for that, it means that God's going to send someone around the corner to humble you, to help you, to learn humility. That's how the Lord answers your prayers. And then what happens? People put up their dukes. They ask for God's help, but then basically without saying it, they're saying, well, not so much help, God. I don't want to humble myself that much. And sometimes they put themselves in the position where they're fighting God. Because we want things according to our own thinking. We want things to be done the way that we think it should be done. And we have not come to understand that man has not wisdom enough to be able to take care of his own affairs and that he needs to submit everything to God, the all-powerful, the all-knowing. 
God. So what happened to the disciples? They were not lost. The only one that was lost was Judas. We have that example for all of us to see how we should not be. We see that Judas went to the wrong place and his, his changing of mind was not sincere repentance. He did change his mind. He did say that he made a mistake. He said, I have sinned. But he said it to the wrong high priests. He didn't go to the high priest. And the high priest, the Lord could have given him the healing. It was actually very simple. Peter, though, separated himself in a very distinct way from the apostles. And that's why in today's gospel reading, we heard the angel say, Go tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth unto you into Galilee, there you shall meet him. It specifically singles out Peter because Peter, who was supposed to be the chief of the apostles, sinned greatly against the Lord, but he was restored and he became a lot greater after his restoration. So what happens to them? They're all searching, they're all looking and the door is being shut, the Lord enters into them. And in the, this whole past week of Thomas, this Thomas Sunday week, we, <clears throat> we heard the dismissal hymn, whilst the tomb was sealed, thou didst shine forth from the grave, O Christ God, and whilst the doors were shut, thou didst come unto thine apostles. And I think many people have been listening to this hymn, but I don't think people really understand. We're talking about two doors being shut. The sealing of the tomb, the, the tomb was sealed, but the Lord came out. He shined forth from the grave, and the doors were shut, and he went into the, the midst of the disciples, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And he went in the midst of the disciples, and he said unto them, what did he say unto them? Peace be unto you. There's a lot of lack of peace around. The lack of peace is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And how is it that the Lord entered in whilst the doors were shut? Who can do such a thing but God himself? Who can roll away the stone from the sepulcher but the power of the Most High God through the angel? So the myrrh bearers were thinking about it sort of last minute on the way there. Who's going to roll away from us, for, for us the stone? Now, you've heard now many times that concerning this stone which represents our heart and which represents actually and the tomb represents our heart, and the stone represents the passions which block us from entering into the tomb, entering into our hearts. And had the holy myrrh-bearing women went there, and the stone, and the stone would have remained there, how would they have learned of the resurrection? They would have been lost. They still would have had a lot of doubts, perhaps, they, they still would have been confused about what happened. But yet the Lord helped them. We need someone to remove that stone. The Lord helped them to recognize the resurrection. They saw the clothes. And in Orthodox theology, you know that we have a strong concept and understanding of holy relics and holy things, clothes. These were the clothes of the Lord that they saw. They were enlightened by these clothes. They were enlightened by looking at the tomb. I know of many people that have gone to the Holy Land who have had life-changing experiences at that tomb of Christ. How life-giving, how much more beautiful than paradise, and truly more resplendent than any royal palace. Prove thy grave, the source of our resurrection, O Christ, we chant in the hymns of the church. And this tomb also is found in every church, the Holy Table. The gospel is there. This is the reason why for the Matin Gospels of Sunday, the priest reads it from the side of the holy table and not from the young one. He reads it from the side representing the tomb as the angel was at the side of the tomb and the stone was rolled away. So the holy myrrh-bearing women got there and not only did they see the tomb, but they saw an angel 
And the angel spoke to them. And the angel gave them the glad tidings that the Lord is risen. So the myrrh-bearing women had received a revelation. After this horrible, difficult time that they went through, then they had this moment of the revelation. As we said, this is spiritual law. This is what happens in the spiritual life. After temptations, we can have grace. And we see it, of course, in the prime example of the crucifixion and the resurrection. They had this visitation of grace. So when we go through some type of a great temptation and we patiently endure it, there will come time, there will come a time when we will have a visitation, a great visitation. And this is what has been happening from the very beginning. And this is what will continue to happen up until the end of the world. We have a hard time when we're in the middle of the temptation. There's no question about it. We get really confused, especially the more we give in to the temptation and the less faith we have. The more we are self-centered and the less we are God-centered, the more difficult it will be for us. We have another good example in today's uh, Minologian today, we have the Synaxarian, we have St. Macarius, the Bishop of Corinth. He lived during the time of the Ottoman Empire. You know that at the time of the Ottoman Empire, our ancestors, our relatives lived as second class citizens, and there were actually many churchmen who were against the revolution, against the uh, against fighting the Ottoman powers in order to achieve the much longed, much longed for freedom of the Greek nation or of the Bulgarian nation or of the Serbian nation or of all those nations that were under the Ottoman Empire. And let's think for a second what their point was. We know that freedom, of course, is a great gift from God. We have freedom now, sort of, especially at least in, in comparison with the uh, communist Russia and the communist nations. That could change at any moment. We're, we're not sure exactly when and how, but definitely before the end there will be a lot of persecution. But what happens in the persecution is that the people being under some type of a temptation, are able to achieve crowns. That's why, why we have temptations. For example, not too long ago, we had the Feast of St. Akakios of Kapsukalivia. St. Akakios, who was a, a man of deep prayer, who had achieved the grace of the noetic prayer, the prayer of the heart, had a vision. He was in paradise, and he saw that all of the Christians in the Ottoman Empire, who paid the head tax, they had to pay a tax for being Christians, found the recompense in paradise. He asked, where did all this come from? Where did all this beauty come from? Where did these homes come from? And he was told by an angel, from the tax of the Christians. The Christians were being persecuted, and they had to pay this tax for being Christians, and they obviously had to make a lot of sacrifices I'm sure there were people who capitulated. I'm sure there were people who apostatized, people who gave up. The weak ones gave up. But thank God, God bless, and God grant rest to our ancestors, the ones who passed on the Orthodox faith to us. And may we have their blessings, and may they find all their sacrifices in paradise. For this reason, some of the fathers understood the blessings that were there. But they also understood that with freedom, a lot of secularism would come. And a lot of people would forget about God. And so that, of course, is what happened. I remember hearing about a statistic at the time when the Ottoman Empire fell. All of the Christians in Greece kept the Holy Great Lent. And then just a few years after that, uh, some people stopped the fast. Of course, this doesn't mean that we don't want our freedom. Freedom, as we said, is a great gift. 
but it does mean that we should understand what happens when the Lord permits certain temptations to come upon us and when we lose our freedom. We should think about it as Christians and we should understand that actually there could be some great benefit from it, specifically from the point of view of those things which await us in paradise. Simakar is the Bishop of Corinth <coughs> and he was sent away. He, he lived as a simple monk, although he kept his Episcopal dignity. He lived as a simple monk when he went to the island of Chios. He was dealing with a lot of the politics of the time. But when he went to Corinth, he, one of the first things he did was he fired a lot of priests. Because there were many priests who were unlettered and who, more importantly and, and worse, worse, they were indifferent. They didn't understand the great mystery of the divine liturgy. They couldn't understand spiritually. They had no spiritual insight into what they were doing. And St. Macarius was there to say, what are you doing, O priest of God? Do you understand what you're doing? He fired many of them. He took them away from their uh, duties. And the ones that he thought that he could salvage, he sent to monasteries. And the ones that he trained, he, the ones that he wanted trained, he would send to monasteries. Because, according to Orthodox understanding, monasticism is the glory of the Church of Christ, and there you will find an, an immersion course. You'll be able to hear the services daily. You'll be able to see the life of Christ lived in a more intense way. And if anybody thinks otherwise, they basically don't have the mind of the church. There were priests. Can you imagine priests would think differently? They're probably very bad priests because they don't understand the spiritual life, probably very proud. They want to have their own spiritual patriarchate or their own monastery, who knows what. But that's not how it is in the Orthodox Church. He would send them to the monasteries so they can be trained. St. Nicodemus of Mount Athos says something akin to this in his writings concerning the Jesus Prayer. Because oftentimes, especially when people are weak, they'll point out the weak ones. They could point out, well, this is a bad monastery. And of course, this is true. There could be a bad monastery. There could be bad uh, abbots, bad bishops, bad priests, bad Christians. Obviously, there will be. But when, what St. Nicodemus says is, he says, with regards to the Jesus prayer, he says, there are people who say, that you shouldn't say the Jesus prayer because you will fall into delusion. And he says they are the deluded ones. Just because somebody has fallen into delusion doesn't mean that the system is not in place. It's all there. And because there's a bad doctor somewhere doesn't mean that you don't have to deal with your health. Just because someone abused the system doesn't mean that the system is not in place. So you work on the Jesus prayer. You say the Jesus prayer. And you understand what the purpose of the Jesus prayer is. And there will be people who will be deluded. But it's not the Jesus prayer's fault. It's because they see the Jesus prayer as some type of a technique and they don't understand it to be the prayer of repentance. So, for this reason, St. Macarius sent his clergy to monasteries so that they could learn something about the spiritual life and not become secular clergy not knowing how to cut their will and not understanding the concept of obedience. Many of them demand even monastic obedience from lay people, which is not right. The lay people don't live like that. St. Macarius is the saint, one of the saints that we celebrate today, and we have his epigonation, his vestments and his cuffs here in the monastery. It's a great blessing for us. We have one of the cups here on the inner logion. So let us remember when we are going through some type of a temptation, let us remember the myrrh-bearing women, let us remember the disciples of Christ, let us remember the saints of God who patiently endured, and let us remember the recompense. Let us remember the, the good things that come out of going through temptations. 
if we go through those temptations in the right spirit as Christians, faithful. The more difficult it will be, the more we give thanks to God, the greater will be the grace of God which comes. And the Lord will not tarry, even though we think he may tarry. Lastly, we have the example of the martyrs. How many martyrs from uh, how many martyrs have we read about who actually did not feel pain in their martyrdoms after they had the initial pain? I've even heard from people who have seen people being martyred in Muslim countries, how the person was absolutely unflinching and saying prayers and confessing Christ and seeming very happy. Well, this person was prepared beforehand by his faith, by his love for God, which is actually a gift which comes from God. So if we, do, if we take the initial steps, then the Lord will take, do the rest of the work for us. We just have to show our own will that we will to follow God's will. And if we will to follow God's will, all things will go well with us. Let us not lose patience, especially if we think that this, that whatever temptation it is that we're going through is taking too long. But let us pluck up the courage to say from our whole heart, glory to thee, O Lord. The Lord knows what's he, what he's doing, and the Lord permits that certain temptations come upon us for our own good. Let us humble our hearts. And let us pray to the myrrh-bearing woman, and together with the myrrh-bearing women, to St. Joseph of Arimathea and St. Nicodemus, whom we also commemorate on this day, to help us through the difficulties of this life, and to give us the grace and the courage to be able to confess our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ up until our last breath, to be faithful servants of his, and if at the time of weakness we become like Peter, let us return to him, the only physician who is able to heal us. And let us take the medicine with thanksgiving, glorifying the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.